Okay, folks, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, I am Gabriel from .cloud. Uh, so .cloud, we're a platform as a service. So we basically we make it really easy to build and deploy your web applications. Uh, so we were recently, we're in the process, I guess, of building out our the web part of our product. Right now, the interaction sort of all happens through a CLI. Um, and I guess also as part of what we do, we were pretty excited to learn about Ember because we are sort of generally interested in what's going on in the future of the web. Uh, so we got, um, we have our sort of front end development team uh, and sort of tasked them with, um, well, playing with Ember a bit to sort of, <coughs> sort of take it through its paces. Um, so first up, we have Yusuf, who's going to be talking about a comparison he did between Ember and jQuery. Um, then Joffrey is going to be telling you guys about a neat little hack we did to attach um, Racer into, uh, into Ember, um, which is a good way to take advantage of WebSockets, which we just released WebSocket support today, a little plug. Um, and finally, uh, Eric, who I'm not sure where he is, but he's also he's just going to be going over sort of a broad overview of, of, uh, of Ember, so what it, what it does and why you should love it. Cool. Yusuf, take it away. Hey, I'm Yusuf. Uh, so let's start with a 30-second spiel about what Ember and Ember data is for anybody who's completely new to the area. Um, and so what Ember is, is it provides you an MVC, MVC framework on the client side. So the whole idea is there's this enforced <coughs> structure that you have for your web applications. And you get a lot of stuff for free, a lot of plumbing that comes with, with it for free. So you, for example, define these models. And as a property changes on the model, it propagates through the system. And so, you know, instead of saying, okay, update this view and things like that, a lot of that stuff is <coughs> automated for you. Uh, Ember data builds on top of Ember. And the idea behind that is uh, transparent mappings between Ember models and uh, a RESTful backend web service or other kinds of backends as well. But right now, the adapter only supports REST. Um, and so the idea behind that is instead of you know, having to make uh, like XHR calls yourself, uh, you can just call you know uh, model dot save and things like that, and it automatically uploads the the model or fetches it from the server. Uh, so what we're what I'm going to talk about today is uh, Ember JS versus jQuery. Um, so we are we're, we were working on an application, and the idea behind this was a SQL uh, results viewer on the browser side. And so you, within a browser, you could run a SQL query. And you could get the results back within your browser, and you could view it on this table, and sort, and filter, and uh, paginate, and all that nice stuff. And you can also share results. Um, and part of the goal of this was because we thought it'd be useful for customers. But the other goal was also we wanted to make two implementations, one in Ember.js and, and one in jQuery, and see uh, where the two implementations, you know, where one implementation went out over the, over the other. Um, so here's just a quick rundown of what the end product looked like. It's still a work in progress, but uh, the basic functionality is there. And you know we have just this SQL uh, editor over here. It's nice and syntax highlighted. That's all from Ace Editor. Uh, you can you know execute your statement, and then you get back all these results. Uh, you can filter it in real time. So as you type, it filters. Uh, there's pagination at the top. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a list of saved queries. You can pull that down and open up other ones. And the whole idea is, as a customer, you can quickly browse your SQL backend without having to resort to the CLI, and you can also share results with one another. So if you were debugging an application because something went wrong, it could allow you to figure out what was going on faster. Um, so here's the architecture that we were looking at. So Doc Cloud is. Um, we support multiple different kinds of databases on the back end. So right now, there's you know, MySQL, Postgres, SQLite. Uh, in the future, for all we know, we could add, add more database services as well. So what we did is, uh, for the server side, we have the Play framework, which is Java. And uh, we connect to the databases using JDBC. The reason why we chose that technology stack is um, because JDP, JDBC is a pretty stable library for, for making queries against databases and it's nice and pluggable so you don't have to do much more than swap out a connection string to connect to a different database and also play framework it seemed kind of cool to play with that is really cool if no one's tried it before it's like rails for java so if no one's tried it i i i'm very fond of it despite it being in java um, so we have now this rest api and the question is is how do we connect that api over to 
the front end. So first of all, the Ember implementation that we looked at. Uh, why did we do that? So we want to see what direction the, uh, the community is going in. And we want to see what technologies are, are on the bleeding edge. So because we're an application platform company, we, we need to know these things so we can stay ahead of the ball game and, and provide first class support for the things developers find important. Um, and then there's jQuery, and you know, jQuery is the gold standard of, of web applications, right? Like everybody uses jQuery nowadays. Um, and I know what everyone's thinking, this is an apples to orange comparison. So of course Ember builds on top of jQuery, so it's a superset of that functionality. Um, and that's a fair argument. However, I would say they're not necessarily all that different in the sense that uh, you're both are trying to allow you to create rich web applications easier, right? So they go about it in very different ways and they achieve it in very different ways, but uh, the important thing is, is which, which of these solutions allow you to create web applications quicker and easier and maintain them in a better manner? Um, so let's look at the two implementations. First of all, code metrics. This is like you know the easiest thing to, to compare against, right? Everybody loves code line, lines of code comparisons. So uh, we have JavaScript, HTML, and Java. Uh, as you see, the jQuery version is marginally shorter. It's not too much. Um, we included Java because there was some changes we had to make to adapt to the Ember data models. So. Um, that required changes on, on the server side. So we think that actually should be reflected in the overall line count as well. That's kilobytes? Okay. No, it's just lines of code. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so size, these are the, the size of the libraries. Base size doesn't really matter. Everybody does minify it nowadays. Uh, so jQuery is 93 kilobytes. Ember.js is plus data is 250 kilobytes. So it's definitely bigger. Uh, I don't think it's anything insurmountable for sure. And especially when you use gzip, that brings it down to a third of the size. Uh, I should have double checked this before I did my presentation, but I've heard from a report from Yahoo, they said something about 50% of their requests are cached when you run it through a CDN. So don't take my word for it, because I want to double check that. But you know, if you do use a CDN, hypothetically, you probably get maybe 50% you know, cut in, in uh, traffic as a result. So if you do these in combination, Ember.js shouldn't be too much overhead. Uh, here was the big hit, though. So the development of the Ember version took about four days, uh, jQuery a few hours. Um, so that, that's a big difference. A lot of that has to do most likely with, um, you know, I, I've done a lot of jQuery application development before, whereas I've done no Ember before this, right? So there's a huge learning, initial learning curve to all of that. So that's, that's fair, but I think some of it also has to do with uh, current issues with Ember, and that's some of the stuff I'd like to address here. And so we as a community can see where we can make improvements. Um, and here's, here's the, the short list of things that I think were the big pain points I had when I was developing it. Uh, lots of magic. So you know, there's Ember monkey patches, the, the client side, it adds stuff to uh, functions and uh, base objects and stuff like that. It creates its own object model system. Um, and there's some consequences to that. So there's nice stuff. It allows you to be terse with, with code. But uh, on the other hand, some of the drawbacks are, you know, console.log doesn't work quite as you expect because it spits out this huge thing instead of, you know, the tiny little JavaScript objects you're used to. Things like that. Uh, and this is... Um, Compounding that issue is that there's there's too little documentation. So I think even the, the Ember core team will admit that the documentation isn't there yet, right? And you know this is a this is a new project, and there isn't a lot of developer hours thrown behind it. So as as this thing matures, that that'll improve, but that would help a lot. <laughs> um, weak debugging facilities. So I'm not sure if this is a fair argument because there was apparently a talk last time about how to debug Ember applications. Uh, I miss that, so I don't know what he talked about there, but I think that would be good because the, <laughs> the default debugging utilities don't work, right? Well, they don't, they work, but they're not as useful as they otherwise would be. And um, as far as I saw, there wasn't really good documentation on how to debug those Ember applications. So I didn't know about the video until pretty recently, for example. Um, there's no one rate ray. So, oh, actually, emphasis on relational data. So that's that's a uh, issue with Ember data specifically, not Ember. 
Um, and that's actually probably an issue specifically with their, their RESTful data adapter. But the, the problem we had there was um, if we had data that didn't quite fit the relational form, it came out somewhat awkward. And I'll go into that a little bit later. No one right way, that's a controversial remark, right? <laughs> like Ember's supposed to be the right way, and you know, like it's Yehuda's one of the guys behind it. He also did Rails. They they also have a lot of yeah, you know, the guiding principle is uh, what is it? Um, yeah, convention over configuration, that's right. Yeah, so that's probably a controversial remark. But what ended up happening is three of us were making Ember apps parallel. And whenever we'd get stuck on a problem, we'd all group together, try to find a solution, and we'd find we had three different solutions for the same problem. So it might just be a lack of documentation that that's the issue there. I'm not quite sure. Um, and performance. So uh, between our, we don't have any hard metrics, but between the, the jQuery version and the Ember one, the jQuery one definitely felt snappier. And there's some stuff going on in the back, er, back end that was, um, well, I'll go into that in a, a second. So. Here's, here's one example. So this is uh, the header being produced by um, the, the viewer. So this is the jQuery version. It's just you know table header versus the Ember data version. And what's happening with the Ember data version is it's inserting a bunch of script tags because uh, as uh, some kind of data changes, that has to be automatically propagated to the view. And so it has to know where to, to propagate that change. And so it has to insert all this stuff so that it it has that stuff for reference. Um, but that blows up the DOM. Yeah? Oh, well, I don't, there's nothing much in, to know here other than there's a boatload of script tags around everything. So everything that might change that's being rendered in an Ember view, it wraps around with script tags. Um, here's the REST API. So. This is the JSON that we're spitting back in the back end. Uh, here's just a snippet of it, but this is what the jQuery version was sending back. Pretty short, because we could model it any way we wanted, and then you know, on the client side, we would adapt that to however, whatever JavaScript objects we wanted. Um, because Ember data provided that transparent mapping, uh, we had to make sure the server side fit what they were expecting. Um, and here's here's a zoom in of part of it. So. This is, uh, this is one of the col a, a descriptor of one of the columns. But each row, each cell, also has one of these giant IDs. So the way we, so first of all, each item in Ember data has to have a unique ID. And the way we approached it that way is uh, we SHA-1 the query and then just threw a bunch of stuff up on the end. And it's not, it's not pretty, right? Like, if, if I were providing this API to third parties for some crazy reason that I wanted to give them access to my SQL database, I wouldn't want to have a bunch of weird IDs thrown in. So aesthetic choices, but uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Question. Part of that's because you didn't write your own adapter, right? Right. So if, if you do not use the REST adapter, then this is not a problem. If you write your own, then you can go around this. And I'll, I'll actually go into that briefly later. Um, so what, where does Ember work really well? Um, this is the other half of the equation that we wanted to solve, right? And I think the greatest thing that we got out of it was complex features came practically free. So when we were talking about uh, pagination and uh, filtering earlier, what's really cool about those is they're just computed properties. So whenever, you know, they're, they're dependent on these other properties and whenever those properties change, the, the computed properties are re rerun with the, the new data, and as the computed property is computed, the, the results are propagated um, automatically to, to uh, the view. So the whole idea is you're not writing any of the plumbing code. That's all taken care of for you. That's really cool. Um, the MVC model forces a lot of sanity, so I'm a pretty lazy developer, and like with the jQuery version, I think I had, I don't know, two objects or something, one for each feature that I had, because um, I had two features. <laughs> And it, was, it allowed me to mix and munch things together. And as, as we throw more developers at an application and as we make it more and more complex, that doesn't scale, right? The, the fact that they force this, this model onto you uh, pays off in the long run. Uh, it's extremely flexible. So this goes back to the adapters. Uh, whenever Ember doesn't do something the way you want it to, it provides you a way to back out and work around it. 
So adapters are an example. Uh, if you don't want to use their RESTful model, then you can, you can write your own adapter. Um, I think the problem with this as it stands now is um, this flexibility lies everywhere, and it's not <coughs> really documented. You don't really know where or how to, how to work around that oftentimes. So the adapter is one of the better documented things. Um, but yeah, uh, code complexity scales slower. So let me go into that. Here's my very objective graph. Uh, uh, across this axis are like different applications of varying, of increasing complexity. So to, everybody does to-do applications, right? On the other end is Facebook, because I couldn't really think of anything on the client side more complex than that. And my theory is that as you increase the complexity of your web application, Ember pays off in dividends. Because it enforces that model, because it takes care of the plumbing for you, um, the complexity increases much slower than if you just use something like jQuery, unless you were very careful about the way you use jQuery and enforced some sort of MVC-like structure yourself. Um, SQL Viewer probably, the, the application we made probably falls somewhere around here. It's not quite the simplest CRUD application, but it's pretty close. Um, and so for our application, yes? So MVC is for server side. Can you implement MVC on the client side? So there's nothing that says MVC has to be on the server side. Historically, it's been on the server side. But what Ember is trying to do is bring MVC to the client side. So I, MVC is historically actually on the client side. Yeah. Oh, well. So like historically on the desktop. <laughs> OK. Right, right, okay, yeah, that's true. So, okay, as of the past five years, <laughs> MVC has been server side, but there's, yeah. There was a world before Rails? Lies. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, point is, is there's, there's nothing about, uh, these are just uh, conventions, right? There's nothing that's preventing you from using it on the client side, and if it helps you write these client side applications better, more power to you, right? Um, but anyway, so the application we made, I think the jQuery version was, uh, a little bit better, and um, that's just because the application was pretty simpler, pretty simple. I think, though, as we added, as we would add more features, uh, Ember is where it would really pay off in dividends. So there's a bunch of things that we want to add later on if we actually push this out, and yeah, then then the Ember version makes sense. Uh, so I think the big question we as a community should be asking is, what can we do to lower barriers to entry? How can we make uh, even the simplest applications uh, easy to pick up and easy to understand. Um, and some of the stuff I've, I've covered before, but uh, I think it's pretty important. Uh, better documentation, you know, this is this is pretty clear. I think everybody agrees on this at that point. Uh, clear conventions, so this might be a, just a documentation thing, but I would love to know what is the right way to do things. That would that would be great for me. Uh, better debugging tools, uh, cross this off. <laughs> I think it's just better documentation of the debugging tools now. So. Um, and you know all all these problems they just uh, they all fold into uh, more developer mindshare. If we have more people working on this, then you know we can improve the documentation, we can improve the applications. Um, you know there's uh, like just even with the library itself. Uh, so Jeffrey's worked on you know this really cool project where uh, he used Racer in combination with Ember and like some of these these interesting combinations of technology. I think some of those will will really show off as as showing off the, val uh, the value of Ember and you know just helping the, the community as a whole. Someone have a question back there? I just wanted to comment that the, the debugging talk was really mostly about just JavaScript debugging. And uh, okay. in my own experience, I find a lot of people don't even realize what like Chrome and Safari and even Firebug today can do. Like there's a huge amount of exploration you can do with the stack and like the execution state of your app that mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of people just don't even realize that's there. So actually, um, when I when I uh, practiced this this presentation, my coworkers grilled me for not giving a concrete example of, of where debugging fell short in Ember. So so let me give a, a concrete example right now. And actually, this is an example of the documentation as well. Um, so we, we're making this application using Ember and Ember data, right? Um, so there's, certain, uh, there's a certain structure that you're expected to have on the server side that you're sending back. Um, if you don't fit that structure exactly, Ember data doesn't create the model, and it doesn't tell you that it didn't create the model. So it pulls down the data, 
And as far as I could see, nothing happened, right? Um, and the other thing on top of that was the, the documentation told you one way of doing it, and it turned out to be wrong with the latest version. So that's, that's a concrete example. Sorry, that, you reminded me of that, that fact. So I, I wanted to go into that as an example of, of where I was hit hard with that. Um, oh, yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> um, but yes, if you have any, okay, there goes my slides too. If anyone has any questions, then. Yeah, I was wondering why you're comparing it to jQuery and not Backbone. Um, because it seems like it's closer, closer in the ecosystem of things to Backbone than it is to jQuery. So. Sure, sure. Uh, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. So it was just, so we wanted to try Ember. The, there was no doubt about that. So it was an Ember versus something. And jQuery was, I guess jQuery was an interesting experiment because it wasn't the same semantics. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to test the, the richness of Ember semantics, a good way might be to say, look at two projects that are trying to solve the same thing in very different ways mm -hmm. and see uh, where the different solutions pay off. It so seems like jQuery originally is just a much lower level library. Yeah, it, it is a library. Uh, I should add that one thing we did on top of with the jQuery implementation is we used John Resig's micro template model. So that that made a huge difference because otherwise it would be an impossible mess. So that's like a 15 line little JavaScript thing that allows you to render templates on the fly on the, the client side. Did you get into reading the source for Ember much? A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. I was surprised I'd been playing around with it for days and had no idea what was going on, no documentation. And the source is actually decently yeah, you know, yeah. documented, so that helped, but it's certainly not there yet. Right, so actually that's how I ended up solving my problem. So uh, I'm, I'm a very conservative and afraid developer. I do not touch code um, outside of what I'm writing sometimes. <laughs> like I avoid it too much maybe. So eventually I did decide to dig in and that's when I could start debugging much, much quicker to figure out what was going on. So that, that yeah, that helps a lot. And are you going to go deeper into like some of the stuff you said that gives you pagination and sort uh, sorting? And I have questions about the pagination, but okay. what is, how does it give you pagination for free? Like, what so, is it by what mechanism? So I have two computed properties that stack on top of each other. So uh, I have the, the first. Do you want to explain what a computed property is? Sure. So what a computed property is is it's a, a function that observes uh, a property and whenever that property changes, which you know might be like an attribute in a model or something like that, then it reruns the function and it produces a property itself. And you can actually stack computed properties on top of each other and say one computed property is dependent on another, which in turn might be dependent on just normal properties. So that's actually what I did in this instance. So what I had is a computed property for filtered results and every time you rerun, or every time you, you change the text in this, it uh, reruns the, the filtration. So not the most efficient mechanism, but it works great. Um, and that, what that does is it takes the, the list of results and uh, filters out the irrelevant ones. And then there's a computed property on top of that that says, just show me the results within the current page that I'm in. And then this goes through each of those results within that computed property and displays So this it. is all on the local data? This is all in the local data, so, yes. Okay, so for the pagination specifically, say I have a thousand records on the server and I get a hundred back or mm -hmm. whatever, right? So is it, am I paginating through the hundred or the thousand? Are you paginating? So am I paginating just through local data that I've eagerly loaded or can I lazily load each page at a time with Ajax crawl? Oh, I see. No, you will not lazy load. Everything here is just pulls it down. Mm. This is, so let me back to so with basically you're going to get all the data client side and then it's going to yes. be up to you in javascript to paginate it yes so. so this is the number of lines of code it's a very small application <laughs> <laughs> so i'm not i'm not advocating doing some of this stuff on production but this is stuff where we wanted to see you know where ember paid off and where it didn't and that pagination that ember gave you was for the local data yes okay yeah, this is all local data that we were running against. Okay. It helps clarify, like, it's data that is in memory in the browser, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Just 
the reaction? It seems like a lot of your problems are also related to the fact that you didn't write your own adapter, which kind of makes sense, I guess, for just like test, going for a test drive. But any uh, core project that I've seen at scale, in fact, before before Ember, you had to write your own adapter. Unless someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but anything that a company has been launched on that's used this framework when it was Sprout for Ember, you pretty much write your own adapter because it's otherwise it's like it's like organizing your database according to the way that Rails wants to read your objects rather than you have the idea that you want your data to look. So it seems if you're writing any code project, it's my experience, and I'd love for someone to correct me if they think this is not right, but that writing your own adapter is a pretty important part to writing it's for simple, application that's not, and it's very simple. So I'm glad you said that because that's the perfect segue for <laughs> Jeffrey because that's basically what he did. Uh, he used Ember, but then he, he wrote some of the stuff that actually communicates with the server end. So my goal was to look at Ember and Ember data. Um, his goal was to see you know, if we wrote our own solution for the uh, back end, front end communication, how would that play out? Yeah. And it wasn't quite an adapter, but similar idea. I would look at the current REST adapter as like a throwaway, like training wheels, okay. just to get you going. But okay. I think even the current state of it is not serious enough for like, it, it's not a mature piece of code. For well, sure. well, first off, Ember Data is still uh, considered alpha quality, too, yeah. so <coughs> it's not necessarily recommended for use in production. It is being used in production now. Uh, <laughs> so, as you know, is if always you're not the case. willing to invest the time to <coughs> fully broke all of the latest developments in Ember Data, you're going to be, you know, uh, struggling. So yes, like the, uh, just to clarify a few points, the data, Ember Data is completely new to Ember. It's, there was also a data store in Sprout Core, uh, <coughs> 1X, and was also ported in 2X that I think uh, was being referred to previously. And that's something we're trying to improve upon. It was, in fact, that in the past you typically had to write your own adapter. Uh, and that made a lot of sense because everybody is going to have their own API and there's going to be certain you know, uh, unique characteristics that your API has. So it's hard to generalize an adapter for that. But um, yeah, so uh, there's, we're, Ember Data is still a work in progress. The REST adapter is something that is you know, hopefully going to be an idiomatic part of using Everdata with Rails, along with active model serializers, which is a project that Yehuda and Jose and I think Carl have been working on. Um, but certainly these are evolving patterns that have not fully been fleshed out. So you're going to, you know, struggle with them. That's good to know, thank you. Uh, so I mean, is it too basic to ask what is an adapter? <laughs> it's a, an, an adapter is the code that translates your API calls to Ember data, basically. So, so that you can, you, of the top of yeah, so you can write your, your Ember data code, and the whole idea is you can swap out the adapter for a custom one, and instead of doing the RESTful calls the way it normally does it, you could have it, I don't know, do something else. <laughs> so also, I'm going to be doing an intro talk later, so we, you guys can say if you have questions about Ember or Ember Data, I can answer them later. Anybody else? <clears throat> cool, thank you. I'll try to explain the concepts along when I <coughs> go to something that's Ember related. So hopefully I won't last, lose people that are not familiar with it yet. So um, I've been working with interfacing Ember, Ember JS, and Racer in uh, a seamless way. Th that means uh, basically I, I'm modifying the Ember base classes uh, to make it uh, completely transparent to the, to the developer. 
So it's kind of a, a hack right now, and, and but it was really fun to do. And so first of all, I'll be introducing Racer. So it's a Node.js model that's currently under active development. Um, it's used to synchronize data uh, on multiple clients uh, in real time. So clients could be browsers, typically, but it could also be servers uh, that are like synchronized together. It relies on WebSockets with Socket.io. Um, the good point with that is, first of all, you can push they uh, push changes to, to the to the browser directly <coughs> instead of pulling for it and etc. And you ha you also have less overhead because you don't carry your HTTP headers back and forth every time you you pass data around, right? And um, also one cool feature of Fraser is you have built-in conflict resolution, which is uh, quite nice to have when you have a lot of concurrent changes happening, right? Um, so here you can see, so we have a, a reference model that's on the server. Uh, every time a, cli a client connects, uh, the, um, uh, the model is copied. And so then when you change something uh, in the model, uh, it triggers a, tra a transaction that's passed to the server. And the server then propagates the change to all the other clients. So that's it for Racer. Um, so how does Ember.js enable uh, the seamless communication and how does it empower it, basically, is what uh, we'll focus on. Uh, so we use the, the, the features of the Ember.js object model extensively. First of all, we use the enumerables. So the enumerables, uh, it's sort of an interface uh, more technically, it's a mix-in, but we'll, we'll call it an interface. Um, it represents a collection of objects uh, in Ember. So it could be anything from a JavaScript array with your objects in it to uh, a table in your local storage in HTML5 or a file on your desktop or anything. But the idea is to, have, is to represent any collection of objects. Um, the observers, so these are objects that well observe uh, change of properties uh, on Ember objects. So every time a property change, the observers are alerted and uh, we use that a lot. And finally, mixins. So mixins are sort of a class. Um, so we apply mixins to a class to add functionality to, to them. And uh, the idea is, uh, contrary to inheritance, where you spe specialize a class when you inherit from it, uh, this is really just adding functionality. And you, uh, you can have multiple mixins applied to the same class, uh, just in the same way you could do multiple inheritance in some languages. Uh, so observers. So like I said, we track changes on Ember objects uh, with the observers. So uh, yeah, the idea is to every time a property change, you want to have this change to be uh, propagated to the racer model that, that is then synchronized with all the other clients. And it also works with enumerable, like we can say on the first line here. Um, so an observer, in more detail, it's just an object that implements certain methods. And these methods are called every time something changes. So then in these methods, you can do anything you want, basically. Uh, the make sense then, we use, the, we use them for, for three things. Free, first of all, uh, adding, adding methods to existing classes. So here, as, you, as we can see, uh, we add an update method to the, to the enumerable mixin. Um, the idea of this is we want to update uh, one element in the, in the enumerable, but we also want to alert the observers about, about this change. Uh, if you do a direct access to, to an object in, uh, in the enumerable, this wouldn't work right, because the, the observer had have no idea what you're doing. So we use this uh, really basic function that adds this functionality. Um, well, 
we use it to overload existing methods. So here we have the mutable array uh, class. We have a remove object that, as its name indicates, removes an object from an array. Um, the idea was to add a silent parameter that tells, uh, well, don't alert the, the observers of this change. Uh, it's useful because um, the change that come from the racer model, so from other clients, we don't want to pass them back to the racer model. So uh, every time a change comes from the racer model and not from your client, uh, you, you add or remove an object silently to the and uh, finally, uh, we use it to overload the object constructor. So uh, the idea is to uh, keep track of uh, every attribute that you have in your Ember objects so that you can produce uh, a pure JSON representation of them. Uh, basically, uh, you want to have this uh, JSON <coughs> representation because uh, the thing you want to synchronize and the thing you want to pass around and maybe even persist then on your on your server. Uh, you don't want to have all the added complexity of the Ember objects. So uh, so we modify uh, a bunch of other uh, functions, but this is the, the beginning of it. Basically, we, when you create an object, you declare, you declare all sorts of attributes in this, and you want to, to know them all. So the results of our little hack, uh, we have a tool that's very flexible and adaptable. It works with, uh, with uh, Ember arrays out of the box. And uh, if, you, if your application implements custom enumerables, uh, it w uh, there's very little work to make it work too, and it's documented. So it's really cool. Uh, it's easy to use because we basically the, we only expose two methods uh, that have a, a very simple prototype and uh, it's uh, finally it's lightweight. There's only like 300 lines of code. It could be less if we were if we we're more serious about this. <laughs> basically, um, we encountered some caveats. Uh, First of all, there's an Ember JS limitation, which is uh, when you apply a mixin to a class, it's actually the the methods and the attributes from the mixin are actually copied into the the class you're augmenting instead of just referenced. If you actually use the Ember mixin, don't you? It's not copied then, right? Like you were doing reopen and reopen class, which is which is manually decorating those. Classes and objects. If you actually use the Ember dot mixin, doesn't it actually work like a mixin where it doesn't copy? Um, I'm not sure, but then, well, the thing is, um, even if you were doing that on uh, enumerable, the thing is, the the, for example, the enumerable mixin is already applied on your on your Ember array, and so when you modify the the enumerable class. The, the changes aren't propagated into your Ember array. And that's something that's uh, kind of a weird behavior. You don't want to have that. And, well, but you can circ circumvent it, of course. Um, so the tool we produced has limitations. Uh, we have no order, no order preservation because uh, basically uh, the enumerable as uh, the, the the interface has no notion of order in its more general uh, sense. So we want it to be as compatible as possible with everything. So we don't do order preservation yet. And some racer operations are not supported. So basically, if you just use the tool, you will, uh, you will not encounter this problem. But if you go and <laughs> modify the Sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, what was I about? <laughs> 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 
So yeah, so if you go and modify the, the racer model yourself, and you use some of these uh, methods, so insert, move, things like that, uh, you will have problems, right? And uh, finally, uh, this is not published yet. We, we want to make it public and to make it accessible to you, but uh, it requires some more work. So hopefully, uh, it will be on, uh, on my GitHub, like, soon, soonish, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, that is all for me, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes? So you guys are talking about copying all the models onto the client. How many models are you, are you instantiating at a time? So um, that's, that's really the, the, the racer uh, functionality, but it's designed for uh, real-time applications that have uh, I think more more of a restrained uh, data set, right? You're not actually copying your whole user database on on the client side. There's like some shared state, right? So, but how well, how do you decide what the shared states are between clients? It's up to you as a yeah. developer. It's this basically if you have multiple users manipulating some shared state, that's yeah. the state that you want. Okay. Yeah. It's really good when people are, a lot of users are manipulating the same data structures at the same time because it solves, it does conflict resolution stuff. So I think that's one of the important takeaways with Racer. Yeah. Example would be things like Google Docs or things like that. Like, you know, a simple example would be like a to-do list. Yeah. <laughs> 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 to-do list. <laughs> <laughs>